Hello class, in this video we will be covering the review for test number four, which is over chapters eight and nine. Um, there are, I believe, 40 questions in this assignment. So let me see for sure. Yes, there are 40 questions um, on the entire review. So, for number one, it says a restaurant offers five appetizers and 12 main courses. In how many ways can a person order a two course meal? So to find the number of ways, it's just five choices for an appetizer times 12 choices for um, a main course. Now, if you wanted to include, since the order would not matter here, they're coming both on the same plate. Um, you could get a little bit more complicated than this and say five choose one times 12 choose one. And ultimately you still should end up with the same number 60. So when I type that in the calculator, I do end up with that same 60. So this is what's happening behind the scenes now that we know more about combinations and permutations. Um, now, number two says a person can order a new car with a choice of 15 possible colors with or without seat air conditioning, with or without automatic transmission, with or without power windows, and with or without a CD player. In how many different ways can a new car be ordered uh, with regard to these options? So you have 15 possible colors, two different options with or without air conditioning with or without the automatic transmission, with or without the power windows, and with or without the CD player. So when you multiply all of these together, you end up with 240 ways. Now, for number three, it says a person, or no, a club with 13 members to choose from, or to choose three officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, if each office is to be held by one person and no person can hold more than one office, in how many ways can these offices be filled? So in here, the order does matter. So we won't be doing a combination, we would be doing a permutation. Um, and so then if we have 13 members right here and we're trying to choose three, then it's going to be 13 permutation of three. So when I type this on the calculator, I do get uh, 1716. Now number four says, at a benefit concert, eight bands have volunteered to perform, but there was only enough time for five of the bands to play. How many lineups are possible? Now, since we're talking about lineups, the order does matter because one person goes on stage first, then another, then another, and so on. Um, you don't have the two people on the stage at the same time, or, I mean, it is possible, but that's not the situation that they're describing here. Um, and it's also possible that in a concert, someone or a band could be on the stage more than once throughout the whole concert, but that's not, again, the situation they described here. So in this case, it's just talking about the lineups, so the order does matter. Um, and so then what we're going to do is if they have eight bands and there's only enough time for five to perform, then we're going to be doing eight per, uh, permutate five. And when I type that in the calculator, I do get 6,720. Now number five says, an election ballot asks voters to select five city commissioners from a group of 18 candidates. And how many ways can this be done? Now you're talking about uh, commissioners, they all hold equal weight from each other. So then in this case, the um, order would not matter. There's not one commissioner that has a higher position than another. So the order doesn't matter, you're just picking five. So in this case, we would be using combination and it would be 18 combination five. And we do, when I type that in the calculator, I do end up with this value 8568, which is what we have here. 
Now, number six says, you volunteer to help drive children at a charity event to the zoo, but you can fit only seven of the 19 children present in your van. How many different groups of seven children can you drive? So in this case, you're just picking the seven and sticking them in your vehicle, right? They're not telling you, you know, what's the probability or, you know, how many ways can you fit them in each individual seat? So in this particular case, again, the order does not matter. So what we're doing is we have 19 and we're choosing, excuse me, seven of those children. And when you type that in the calculator, you do end up with 50,398 possible weights, which means those are the possible number of groups that you could get. Now, seven, number seven says, of 18 books possible, you plan to take four with you on vacation. How many different collections of four books can you take? Again, here, it's not asking you, you know, the order in which you're going to read them. It's just telling them which, how many you're going to stick in your bag. So here, the order does not matter as well. So we will be using combinations. So you have 18 to choose from. You're going to choose four. So 18 combination of four is going to be 3060. Now number eight says to win at lotto in one state, one must correctly select six numbers from a collection of 58 numbers, one through 58. The order in which the selection is made does not matter. So here they explicitly said that the order does not matter. So we know we're gonna be using combinations. It says how many different selections are possible? So you have 58 numbers in the lotto to choose from. They're going to pick six. Um, and so what are all the different combinations of picking six? Um, it's this large number, which happens to be like 40,475,358. Now, number nine says the Senate in a certain state is comprised of 54 Republicans, 45 Democrats, and one independent. How many committees can be formed if each committee must have three Republicans and two Democrats? Now here, notice that I left out the independent, but if I had added in this spot a times one choose zero, it wouldn't have affected the outcome. It would have still been the, this outcome because one choose zero is just the number one. So if I take this number times this number and multiply it by one, it's gonna have the same um, value. Okay, so I did not include it in there, but in essence, I should have, okay, because there's three different groups here, and we're picking however many from each group, but since it didn't say anything about independence, we were picking none from that particular group. So it did want to know if we had three Republicans, so it's 54 choose three, and we did have 45 Democrats, so it's 45 choose two, and then the one dependent, it would be one choose zero. Um, and in this case, the order did not matter again because you're just getting committee. All the committee members are like on the same level. Not one is in a different position than the other. So the order does not matter. Now, number 10 says, how many different four letter passwords can be formed from letters A, B, C, D, E, F, and G if no repetition of letters is allowed. So if it's a password, then the order does matter, right? The way you type in those letters matters in order for the password to be accepted. So in this case, we have to use permutations. And since we have seven letters to choose from and we're picking four letter passwords, it's gonna be seven permutation four which in a calculator does result in 840. Number 11 says, in how many ways can a person order one ice cream cone with three different flavors of ice cream if there are 13 flavors to choose from and it matters to the person how the three flavors are stacked? So again, here they're uh, explicitly telling you that the order matters. Um, so which flavor is on top, middle, and bottom, okay? So the order matters. Now we do have um, 13 flavors to choose from and we're only selecting three. So it's gonna be 13 permutation three, which is again, 17, 16. I think we entered this same thing in the calculator on a previous problem. 
Now, number 12 says you select a family with four children. Find the probability of a family with exactly one male child. Well, in order for me to do that, I had to list all the possibilities of these four children. Um, now, it did not state whether the order mattered or didn't matter. So I don't know for sure that this is deemed the same as this. So what I did was, is I listed all of the possibilities of these four children and their genders based on the order in which they were born. So I have all females, you know, three females first and then a male, uh, two females, then a male, then a female, a female first, a male, then two females, a male first, and then three females. So those are all the situations of just having one male. Then here I have all the situations of having two males and two females. Then I get into all the situations of having three males and one female. And then finally, the situation where you could have all four as male. Now, out of all of these, there are 16 total possible combinations, okay? But they're asking me for the probability of having exactly just one male child. It didn't say whether that male child was the first child, the second child, third child, or fourth child. So then that means I'm going to count all of these scenarios as this particular outcome, okay? So I've got four options with this particular outcome out of the 16 total outcomes, and that reduces down to one fourth. So the probability is about 25%. Now 13 says, you select a family with four children, the probability of selecting a family with at least one male Oh, the probability, this one's different. I was doing this one actually, or something, okay? No, no, I was doing that one. So the circled one is, this one's correct. I'm done with that one. I explained it correctly. I'm getting confused on this one. <laughs> it says, you select a family with four children. Find the probability of selecting a family with at least one male child. So what I'm doing is, is I'm looking through all of here and I'm finding the situation that has at least one male. That means it could have one male, two males, three males, or four males. It just has to have at least one, okay? Well, if you look at this, every single one of these has at least one, except for that one outcome right there. So what that means is that of all 16, 15 of these options have at least one male out of the total 16. And this could not reduce, so that was the probability 15 over 16. There are 15 outcomes with this criteria out of 16 total outcomes. Now, number 14 says two fair dice are rolled. Determine the probability that the sum of the two dice is 10. So they didn't create this chart for me, so I did. This is basically saying like first roll was a one, second roll was a two. First roll was a one, second roll was a two. And so I did that all for all possible second rolls if the first roll was a one. Then I did all possible second rolls if the first roll was a two. Similarly, if the first roll was a three, a four, a five, or a six. And so these are all the possibilities of rolling those two die. Now for number 14, it says determine the probability that the sum of the two dice is 10. And so the only places where I saw that um, the sum was 10 was here where it underlined six plus four, five plus five, and four plus six. So there were only three of those cases out of the whole bunch. So three outcomes met this criteria. And here there are one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the whole box is 36 um, entries. So out of the 36 total outcomes. And that actually reduces to 112. Now for number 15, again, it's talking about two pair of dice rolled. Since I already made this chart, I'm just going to use it. I'm not going to rewrite it. Um, it says determine the probability that the sum of two dice is four or eight. So here I circled where the sum of the two dice is four, and here I circled where the sum of the two dice is eight. So how many 
outcomes meet that criteria, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight of those 36 outcomes meet that criteria, which reduces down to two over nine. Now, number 16 says a group of four men and seven women, or a group consists of four men and seven women. Three people are selected at, uh, to attend a conference. In how many ways can three people be selected from the group of 11? So you have 11 total people and you're just choosing three people in general. We're not stating whether they're men or women. So the order does not matter here because all of them are going to the conference exactly the same. There's not in one position higher or lower than the other. So we're going to do 11, choose three, and we get 165. Then part B says, in how many ways can three women be selected from the seven women? So if I take the seven women and I take three of those specific seven women, we're going to get 35 possible ways. And so then the part C says, find the probability that the selected group will consist of all women. So essentially what should be happening here is we should be saying from the four men, we choose none of them. From the seven women, we choose three. And then from the 11 total possible people, we chose three. Remember what we've talked about here, four choose zero, anything choose zero is just going to be the number one. And so it's, in essence, one times anything is just going to be that same thing. So you are just taking this ratio. So seven choose three, we already said was 35, and four choose three or I'm sorry, 11, choose three. Um, we already just, uh, figured out was 165. So when you put this in your calculator to simplify it, it does simplify down to seven over 33. Now number 17 says, in one lottery, a player wins the jackpot by matching all five distinct numbers drawn in any order from the white balls one through 41 and matching the number on the gold ball one through 35. If one ticket is purchased, what is the probability of winning the jackpot? Now here the order does not matter. One for the gold ball, it has to be the exact same thing. So there's no order involved there. But for the five other um, white balls that were selected, it doesn't matter whether what order you chose those five numbers, as long as all five of those numbers are on your ticket. So order does not matter here. So since order does not matter, that means we're going to be using combinations. So how many, we got to fit, uh, find the number of outcomes that fit this specific criteria. So of the five, um, and actually there's, there's more going on here. Um, because there are 41 balls total. So there's actually more going on here. It's actually going to be um, of the five winning balls, you're going to choose those five because they have to match in order for you to win. Um, but there are 41 total. So 41 take away five is actually 36. So of the 36 non-winning balls, we're not going to pick any of those. Then from the one gold ball, we have to pick that ball in order to win. But from the other 34 balls, we're not going to pick any of those because we're trying to find the outcome where we win the jackpot, okay? But at the bottom, um, we know that we have to do all possible outcomes. So we're taking 41 win or lose balls and choosing five. And then we're taking the 35 gold balls, win or lose, choosing one, okay? Now we already know that when you choose zero, that this value is just going to be the number one. Same thing goes here. So when you take anything times one, you get that same thing. And when you take anything times one, you're going to get the same thing. So that is why this fraction is equivalent to this one. And why I don't even mention the, the parts where I'm choosing none. Okay. But in essence, this is what should be happening when you set it up. But 
because these are one, I didn't include them in my, my uh, fraction down here. So it says, um, when I typed in the whole fraction, it gave me a decimal. So I compute the numerator and denominator separately. So when I typed in this in the calculator, it did just give me one. And when I typed this in the calculator, it gave me this fraction. And since the numerator is one, that fraction cannot be reduced. So that is the probability of getting the jackpot in this particular lottery. Now for number 18, it says, um, a box contains 14 transistors, five of which are defective. If five are selected at random, find the probability of the statements below. Now here you're just choosing five, not one is more significant or important than the other, so order does not matter here. So we will be using combinations. Now, if five are defective out of the 14, that means that nine are not defective. Um, so part A says wants us to find the probability that all are defective. So of the nine non-effective, we're choosing zero. And from the five that are affected, we're choosing those five to be selected. And then out of the, all the possibilities, we just have 14 total transistors and we're choosing five. So this gives me one, this gives me 2002. We could type the whole thing in and you still get the same fraction. Now, for the probability that none are defective, that means of the nine non-defective, you're gonna choose all five from this group. And from the five that are defective, you're gonna choose zero. And then the same all outcomes as all 14 transistors choosing five. So when we type this in the calculator, we do get this, okay? Um, it will go from here to here if you type in the whole thing. If you type in the numerator and the denominator separately, which I have a habit of doing, um, then you do have to type, you do have to reduce that. Um, and when I, to reduce it, all I did was type in this fraction and then it reduced it for me. Now for number 19, it says a professor had students to keep track of their social interactions for a week. The number of social interactions over the week is shown in the following group frequency distribution. What is the class width? So I did randomly take some groups, normally do the top, the bottom, and maybe even one in the middle just to make sure, um, but you're counting the width of this group. So you're counting 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So the width of this group is 10. It should be consistent across the board because that's how frequency distributions are created. So I just verified by looking at the bottom, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 110, 111, 111, 112, 113, and then 114. And so the width of this one is also 10. So 10 is going to be the class width. Now, number 20 says, as of 2011, the following are the ages at which a country's presidents were inaugurated. And so we have all of the data here. It says, construct a group frequency distribution for data. Use 41 through 45 for their first class and use the same width for each subsequent class. Now the computer did already do the aging groups for us. We didn't have to worry about creating that, um, but we did need to fill in the boxes with the frequency. So what I did was I went through all of these and I underlined all of the ages that were in this uh, class and there were five of them. Then I went back up there and I did like a curved underline for all the ages between 46 and 50 and found out that there were 10 of them when I counted. Then I did like a box underline for this class and there were 10. Then I did like an upside down carrot um, or V underneath for this class and I counted there were six. Then I circled the guys in this class and I counted eight. And then I squiggle underlined the numbers in this class and there were five, okay? So I just use different symbols. Some people just cross out. Um, the only reason I don't like to cross out is because once you've crossed out all of these and then you cross out this, it's hard to keep track of the count. Whereas if I use certain different kinds of underlining or circling, then I can count how many of those particular kinds of underlining existed or occurred. Okay, number 21 
says a random sample of 35 male college students is selected. Each student is asked his height to the nearest inch. The heights are shown in the frequency distribution below. Construct a histogram and a frequency polygon for the data. So what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that this data matches the chart. So when we go to a height of 66, the, free, the height um, of the graph should be at three, okay, for the frequency. So 66, this should be at three, which three is right here. And so since this bar is not that high, it's not this option. Here again, the bar is down here instead of at three, so this is not correct. Here the bar is at six, that's not three, which means this one's not correct. This graph was the only one that had the correct frequency for three. Once you have a graph that has the correct frequency for one of the values, then you can go verify that it has the correct frequencies for all the other values. Now, for the other one, it's a polygon representing the frequency data. So I did the same thing, look for 66, for where did it have three? This one did not have it at three. Here, three is down here. So this one did not have it at three. Here again, three is up here. It did not have a mark at three. Um, this one did. And so then you can verify all the other frequencies for all the other values or heights. Now 22 says, A random sample of 40 college professors is selected from all professors at a university. The following list gives their ages. Construct a stem leaf plot for the data and compute complete parts A and B. So the first thing I did was I underlined all of the numbers that started with the two, so 20s. And then once I had all of those underlined, I just listed the, num the, the second digits in order from smallest to largest. Then I did the same thing with all of the numbers that began with the three. I curve underlined did those, and then I placed all of their second digits in order from least to greatest. Did the same thing for the numbers with four as a first digit. I box underlined those, and then I listed all of their second digits in order. Then I kind of uh, V underlined all of the numbers that started with five and wrote down their second digits in order. Then I circled all of the numbers um, that started with six and wrote down their second digits in order from least to greatest. It says, what does the shape of the display reveal about the ages of the professors? Option A says the greatest number of college professors are in their 40s. That's true because look at how many second digits there are. That means there's a bunch of numbers in here that were in their 40s, okay? Um, and it's way more than any of the other numbers. So way more digits with 40 as their first number than 20, 30, 50, or 60. Now it says B is the second option, says if you are younger than 30, you cannot be a college professor. Well, that's not true. There's people in their 20s that are college professors. And then C says none of the college professors live to be 70 years old. We don't know that. This chart does not tell us that. Um, all it tells us is that there's no teachers at 70, which means they could have retired before 70. Okay, so we don't know how long they live. That's not what this chart represents. So, and it can't be none of the above because A is true. So the option here to choose is A. Now, number 23 says, find the mean for the following group of data items. So remember mean is represented by X bar. And to do that, you're gonna sum up all of your um, data and divide by the number of data. So I added all of these numbers together and got 42. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight data values. So then I divided by eight and I ended up with the mean 5.25. For 24, it says find the mean for the following group of data items. Again, same thing. I added all these together, I got 426, and there are six different data values. So I divided by six and I ended up with the mean of 71. Now finding the mean for a 
frequency distribution is a little bit different than just the list of data. So for the distribution, uh, you have to find the sum of the uh, X times the frequency. So the data value times the frequency and then add all of those together. And then you're gonna divide by the sum of all the frequencies, okay? So this is the same thing as instead of saying um, score one, so instead of going one plus one plus one plus two plus two plus two plus three plus three plus three plus three, four plus four plus four plus four plus four plus five plus five plus five plus five plus six plus six plus six. Plus six. I'm sure you get the pattern now. I'm running out of space to do seven and eight. But instead of adding three ones together, adding three twos together, adding four threes together, adding five fours together, four fives, four sixes, five sevens, and three eights. Instead of doing all of that in the calculator, it's the exact same thing, and you can verify on your own, as just multiplying these together and then adding up all of those products. You do get the same exact value because we know that repeated addition is the same thing as multiplication, okay? So for this little entry here, you're gonna get three. For this little group here, you're gonna get a sum of six. For this group here, you're gonna get the sum of 12. For this group here, fours, you're gonna get the sum 20. And then you still have to add all of those up together. So that's why these uh, formulas are equivalent to one another. And since these are your frequencies, it's telling you how many of each of these you have. So you actually have three plus three more data values at six plus four more is 10, put 15, uh, 19, 23, 28, and then 31 total uh, values of data. So that's the same as the sum of the frequency. So once we compute these sum and sums down here, we end up with this. It did say round to three decimal places. So that means that the one does not affect the five. So the result is 4.645. Now for 26, the following set of numbers find the median. In order for you to do the median, you do have to have the data in order from least to greatest or greatest to least, but normally we do least from to greatest. So out of these values, I put them in order, 34, 39, 42, 46, 55, and 59. And then I just struck out one on this side, one on that side, next. But now I have two in the middle. And when you get two stuck in the middle, you do have to take their average. So you add them up together and divide by the two values in the middle. And we get 44 as the median. Now for number 27, it says find the median for the following group of data items. So again, I took those same five data items and put them in order from least to greatest. And then I did the same thing. I crossed out two on this side, two on that side, and I had one item in the middle. So that is my specific mean. Now for number 28, it says find the median of the data items in the given frequency. So these are already listed in order with their frequencies. So I'm just cross, doing the same thing, crossing out the same number of data values on the left as I do on the right. So here, if I wanted to cross out these four, I would cross out these three and then uh, one more from here. So when I scratch out one more from there, I actually have two left, okay? Then when I go to scratch out this one, I'm going to have to take one from that two and now I only have one left. Then when I go to take out four, I'm gonna take out this one and these three to get to that four. Now what happens is, is if I want to get to two, and I think I might have um, made an error in there, so I'm gonna fix it now. Um, so four took out one of those, I had two left, one took out another one, so I had one left. These four took out these four, and now I have these. So these two can take out two of these, but that will leave me with four sixes left over, or four fours, I'm sorry. So if you have four fours left over in the middle and you keep the same situation going on, you still have two guys in the middle. I'm gonna wait for it to focus. There we go. 
And with those two fours stuck in the middle, you're supposed to take their average. But lo and behold, when you take the average of two fours, you get just four. Okay, so four is the median here. Now for 29, it says, find the mode for the following group of data. Now, mode is the values or the data values that repeat the most, okay? And so in this set of data, there are only two data values that repeat, and that is the data value, third, or there's only one data value that repeats, and that is the data value 32. So since it's the only one that repeats, that is going to be our mode. Similarly, for number 30, the only data value that repeats is 42. So again, that is my mode. For number 31, um, you have a bunch of them that repeat, but which one repeats the most? It would be the one with the highest frequency. So there are seven of this data value. So that means that that data value five is our mode since it repeats the most. Now for number 32, it says find the mid-range of the following group of data. So mid-range is basically the highest value plus the lowest value over two. So I always say high plus low over two. And so the highest value here is 22, the lowest value here is 15. So I added them together and divided by two and that resulted in 18.5 as the mid-range. Now for 33, the mid-range of the following group of data. So again, we're going to take the highest value plus the lowest value and divide it by two. The result is 4.45. For number 34, finding the mid-range, it's the same thing. The highest data value is 24, the lowest data value is 17, and divide those by two, the result is 20.5. For number 35, it says, use the display of data to find the mean, median, mode, and mid-range. So what I've done is I've put the data in a table. So this helps me because I can read this better than this. That's just me. So for the data value of 10, it has a frequency of three. For 11, it had a frequency of two. For 12, it had a frequency of five, and so on and so forth for all the values up to 15. Now, in order for me to get the mean, I have to find these products and sum them all together. So the sum of the products is 247. The sum of the frequencies is 20. And then that uh, quotient is going to be 12.35. It does say round to the nearest 10th. So the five does change the three to a four. So that box has got to be 12.4. Now the median, since I already have it in its box form, I could do that same striking out. They're already in order. So I'm just gonna take out three from here, which takes out one from there and two more from here, leaving me with one. Then I'm gonna scratch out two from here, which means that one and one more from here, leaving me with five. Then I'm going to scratch out, um, well, I can't scratch out five because then I'd be left with nothing. So I'm gonna scratch out four. If I scratch out four from here, I'm gonna be left with one. And if I scratch out four from here, I'm gonna be left with one, which means I have a 12 and a 13 left in the middle. So whenever there's two numbers left in the middle, you have to add them together and divide by two. And that results in a median of 12.5. Now, the last part says, select the correct, Choice below, if necessary, fill in the answer box to complete your choice. A, the mode of the data is blank, or B, there is no mode for the given data. So looking at these frequencies, we do have a data value that repeats more than any of the other data values, and that data value is 13. So the mode is 13. And then the last one says the mid-range of the data, so the lowest value or the highest value plus the lowest value divided by two which results in 12.5. Now, number 36 says, find the standard deviation for the group of data items. So this is the formula for the standard deviation, which means I do need to know what X bar is first, the mean. So for the mean, I added all the values together and divided by the number of values. So all of these added together is 102. 
And there are six data values here. So I divided by six and that resulted in a mean of 17. So what I did was I took each one of these numbers and subtracted the mean and then squared it, okay? And then I'm attempting to sum them all together. I just wanted to write down what the squares look like before I add it all together. So 15 minus 17 is negative two, but I got to square it and add it to the next one. 17 minus 17 is zero, so that happens four times. And then 19 minus 17 is two. Again, I have to square it and sum it all together. So essentially what I have here is negative two squared, which is four, two squared, which is four, plus a bunch of zeros. So that gives me eight in the numerator and six, which was the number of data values minus one is just five. So I typed this in the calculator and I got this. Now I could have typed the whole thing, but I could do this in my head pretty easily. So I did not type in the whole radical with the fraction inside in my calculator. I waited till the simplified version and then typed that in my calculator. Now it does say round to two decimal places. So this four does not change the six. So it's just 1.26. Now number 37 says find the standard deviation for the group of data. Again, standard deviation requires me to know what the mean is. So I added all of these values together, divide by the number of values, which is seven, and I got 19. So in order for me to find the sum of all these differences squared, I'm gonna first find all of the differences squared and then add them together. So 15 minus 19 is negative four. I still have to square it and add it to the next one. And that happens three times. Then 19 minus 19 is zero. Again, square it, add it to all the others. And 23 minus 19 is four. That happens three times. I squared all of them and then add them all together. Now this one I did type, um, what I typed in the calculator, because I already know what four squared is, negative four squared and four squared is the same thing. They're all 16. So what I did in the calculator is I did 16 plus 16 plus 16 plus zero plus 16 plus 16 plus 16. And I got 96. And seven minus one I did in my head, that's six. And then I typed this in the calculator and I got four. Now, you could just type this whole thing in the calculator and it will still give you that same four. Um, so the standard deviation there is four. Now for number 38, it's the same thing. So here we go, finding the mean. We add up all this together, divide by the number of values. There's eight, and that results in a mean of nine. So 11 minus nine is two, seven minus nine is negative two. And it just keeps repeating that pattern until we get to the last seven. Um, and this is two plus, or four plus four plus four plus four. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fours to add up, which is 32. And then data, number of data minus one is gonna be seven. Get that quotient and that radical value. And then it says round to two decimal places. So this eight does change the three into a four. Okay, number 39 says use the display of data to find the standard deviation. So here, the only thing that's different is the way we calculate the mean, okay? So I did put the chart data in, um, uh, I did put the histogram data in a chart form. So for the data value seven, its frequency is six. For the data value eight, the frequency is eight. For the data value nine, the frequency is six. So I found those products, took that sum, and I got 160, took the sum of the frequencies, and I got 20. And so then the mean is just going to be eight. So then there's a different formula when you're finding the standard deviation of a um, frequency distribution, because we know that certain data values are going to repeat over and over and over again. So that's why we have this times F here, OK? And then you're doing the sum of the frequency minus one, right? That's the same like in. So whatever you have down here in your mean and your denominator, you're just basically going to take that value and subtract one, which is what we've been doing this whole time, okay? It's just the formula looks different than the regular um, formula. So I'm going to basically find all of these subtractions, and I actually squared them anyway. So I did uh, seven minus eight, which was negative one. But when I squared negative one, I got a positive one. Then eight minus eight was zero and zero squared is still zero. And then nine minus eight was one and one squared is still one, okay? So I've already done the subtraction and the squaring. 
Now what I have to do is remember that this value is gonna appear six times. So instead of doing those squared, one plus one plus one plus uh, six of them, we just do that uh, squared value times six, the next squared value times his frequency eight, and then the one squared value times its frequency six. And so when I did all of this in my, I did it in my head because that's six plus zero plus six, which is just 12. And then 20 minus one is 19. I typed this in my calculator and I got this decimal. It did say round to the nearest hundred. So that's the second spot. The four does not change that nine. So what I type in the box is 0 0.79. Now for number 40, it says find the standard deviation for the group of data. Again, I like to have the data flat, you know, laid out. So um, I did, I put these in order. So I did one, six, that's 16, one, eight, and there's three of them. So there's three 18s, one, nine, so there's two 19s, and then two, zero, two, two, and then two 23s. And then I took the sum of all of those and divided by the number of them, and there are 10 values there. And I got this as the mean. So I did 16, take away 19.6, got negative 3.6, which still needs to be squared and added to the next um, subtraction. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Now I did 18 minus 19.6. I did that three times. Then 19 minus 19.6 twice. 20 minus 19.6 once. 22 minus 19.6 and then 23 minus 19.6 twice. And I still have to square all of those and then add them all together. And then at the bottom, it's the number of data, which was 10 minus one. So here um, I did type in the whole numerator and I got 50.4 and then 10 minus one is just nine. So then I typed in this in the calculator and it gave me this decimal and it says round to two decimal places. So the six here will change this six there to a seven. So the result was 2.37. So this is the end of um, our last unit. Now there are two more sections that will be covered um, before the final exam. And those sections are from chapter 10. So you will see some videos for chapter 10. There's only two. And then um, we'll be doing the review for the final exam. Now, the review for the final exam, <clears throat> excuse me, is a standardized review. So the department has already created that final exam and the department has already created that final review and the department has already um, asked an, another instructor, it's not me for that one. There are, there are certain courses where I do record the final review video, but for this class, I was not selected to record the final review video. So that is a departmental uh, video that was created, not my own video. So I will link it um, in Canvas, but it won't be me going over the review. It will be another instructor. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. But that is the end of this video, and I will see you in the next one.